So I'd like to introduce the activism panel. Our moderator today is Gina Dunlap. Gina is a 2019 Loeb Fellow and public servant who has engaged with public and private interests to direct initiatives supporting placemaking, community development, sustainability, and historic preservation since 2004. She appreciates the need for multidisciplinary approaches when tackling disruptive redevelopment efforts to improve quality of life in place. While facilitating change through the built environment is critical, she believes, she also believes that changing mindsets is paramount to achieving vibrant communities. We have five panelists joining us today for the activism panel. Sasha Costanza Chuck is a scholar, activist, and media maker, and currently associate professor of civic media at MIT. They are a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, faculty affiliate with the MIT Open Documentary Lab, and the MIT Center for Civic Media, and creator of the MIT Co-Design Studio. Their work focuses on social movements, transformative media organizing, and design justice. Sasha's first book, Out of the Shadows, Into the Streets, Transmedia Organizing, and the Immigrant Rights Movement was published by the MIT Press in 2014. Peggy Deemer is professor of architecture at Yale University and an architect practicing in New York. She is the editor of Architecture and Capitalism, 1845 to the Present, and The Architect as Worker, Immaterial Labor, The Creative Class, and The Politics of Design. She is the co-editor with Phil Bernstein of Building in the Future and BIM in Academia. She is the founder and content coordinator of the Architecture Lobby, through which she explores the relationship between subjectivity, design, and labor in the current economy. And we heard about that um, previously from Chelsea. Jess Myers is a writer and strategist focusing on urban planning and architecture. Based in New York, she currently works at La Placa Cohen an arts and culture consulting firm, and is the editorial consultant for the services for the Service Employees International Union book series on social social justice, taking freedom, which will be published in 2019. Her podcast, Here There Be Dragons, takes an in-depth look at the intersection of identity politics and security politics in public space through the eyes of New Yorkers and Parisians. Maya Harakawa is a PhD candidate in the Art History Department at the Graduate Center, City University of New York, where she is writing her dissertation on Harlem in the 1960s. From 2015 to 2018, she taught architectural history at the Bernard and Ann Spitzer School of Architecture at City College. She is a member of and elected delegate in the Professional Staff Congress, the union that represents CUNY faculty and staff. And Jen Grosso is a licensed architect at Skidmore, Owings & Merrill with expertise in New York City large-scale mixed-use projects, including 35 Hudson Yards and 11 West 61st Street. She is a founding board member of the Gender Equity Nonprofit Architects X, which also just presented, and serves on the Urban Land Institute's Young Leaders Programming Committee. She holds a BARC from Cornell University. Same as earlier, when we open for questions, we'd like to prioritize questions from women of color first. Take it away, Gina. All right, now, yes, I can hear myself, great. <laughs> Awesome. Um, thank you so much for the gracious invitation um, to moderate the activism panel. And I'd like to thank everybody 
here in the room at this moment um, for showing your deep passion and compassion um, for one another, um, as well as for the groups that you serve, the stakeholders, for engaging this work and uh, you know taking action on the why, why you chose your respective professions and disciplines. And so we want to have a conversation um, that helps uh, demonstrate the power that each of us have in our own individual way, how we express um, our desire to, to create and promote crop positive change. Um, activism, like many of the topics that have been discussed today, uh, can be very personal. Right? There's no one size or one, one strategy that works for everyone, but I truly believe that um, this panel is very representative in terms of the respective ways in which they've brought activism um, into the work and into their professional lives. So, Sasha, could you maybe start us off by explaining or sharing to us what activism means to you? Sure, thank you, Gina, and it's really a pleasure to be uh, here on this panel. Thanks for having me. Um, to be honest, um, I the communities that I'm working with, um, and one of the, one of the groups that I'm spending a lot of time working with now, it's called the Design Justice Network, um, and it actually comes out of several years of organizing in the context of the Allied Media Conference. Allied Media Conference is a space where cultural workers and organizers and activists from different social movement networks come together every year in Detroit um, to meet, to share skills, to think together about what it means to use. Um, design, cultural production, and media making for, uh, for social justice. And in that context, I think um, if I have sort of one takeaway from all of that work and from the time and energy that the Design Justice Network has put into building a shared set of principles and building a um, sort of a body of knowledge and practice about how to do design in a way that doesn't constantly reproduce white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism and settler colonialism, ableism and other aspects of what Patricia Hill Collins calls the matrix of domination and instead constantly challenges it and tries to overturn it, I would say it's the principle of nothing about us without us that comes from the disability justice movement. So again, like my, my one takeaway on what does it mean to do design work, whether you're designing in the built environment or you're designing um, user interface, uh, which is sort of the area that I work in more, um, I think it's that you need to have people with the lived experience of the issue that you claim to be working on, um, on your team from the very beginning and hopefully through to ownership of the project at the end. So I would say to me, activism that really um, is about nothing about us without us is kind of my uh, guiding star. That's awesome. Um, Peggy, activism in a professional setting, What's your take on that? Um, well, I think I think of activism as a um, a job of changing minds, uh, changing behavior, and changing institutions. Um, I think one of the things that the architecture lobby has talked about a lot is. Um, the need to move beyond raising consciousness, because um, raising consciousness can happen in a in a fairly safe environment, um, but to actually argue for change means putting yourself on a line. And I think um, maybe uh, this puts it too bluntly, but um, offending <laughs> offending people um, and um, standing in that space of 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 um, dispute and possible um, disagreement and, and, and offense. Um, I, I think we think about the work as um, uh, an institutional critique, an ideological critique, as well as actions that really change those things. But I mean, just to say, when you ask this question, me personally, um, I don't think that I felt like an activist until I went out there and protested with the bullhorns. And um, the very first uh, performance that we made in um, in Venice in 2014, um, I wasn't there. Two others were, and we sent them the bullhorns, and you know, and did all these things. You know, people, but. Um, after that, we decided you know we can't do this in Venice if we if we also don't go to the AIA. Those are the two different kinds of architectural audiences that kind of 
um, scholarly aesthetic, but then on, on the professional level, we had to do it. And, um, and I, I just remember at the first lo at that lobby meeting saying, who's going to go to Chicago with me? And you no, know, actually, I said, who's going to go to Chicago and do this? And nobody said, and it's like, oh my god, I have to do it myself with somebody else. And th so that was the moment when I felt like I got into a really uncomfortable space, but it liberated everything. It's kind of like, well, you can do that. So anyway, it's, it's a performance, um, but it also is about discomfort um, and, um, and breaking eggs. Um, yeah, it sounds like you sort of touched on the concept of risk there. And, and I guess, Jess, we talked a little bit about this, the, I guess the difference or similarities between activism and advocacy. Can you maybe? Um, yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely, Gina. Um, I think that, Peggy, what you just said is really important, that aspect of putting yourself on the line which is why I think that activism is not a fixed identity. I don't think that you are just de facto an activist. Like it involves um, sort of you are shifting in and out of action and I think that's what defines activism. And also what is really important I think to say is your closeness, the, the stakes of your action. Like what are you putting on the line in order to, to do the action that you are doing? which is why I don't always, actually don't at all really consider myself an activist because my work, uh, especially the podcast, has kind of insulated me against having like real stakes. And here, when I say stakes, I'm talking about um, sort of violence and precarity being pushed on you because of the actions that you're taking. So I do, so the work that I've done in terms of, you know, exposing the ways that security politics intersect with identity politics, you know, I'm sort of insulated in a sound booth at MIT, um, and I'm not really putting myself on the line and or like increasing precarity in my own life. Um, and I think that that comes from the way that we position understandings of activism around um, sort of the 1960s understanding of activism as like really putting your body um, on the line um, in front of water cannons, in front of a tech. Uh, in front of dogs, in front of guns, those that kinds of that kind of thing. But what I do like hope with the work that I have done is that it supports activism, and I think that's an aspect of of advocacy, is that it becomes a tool that makes um, conversations that activists are pushing easier to have because it puts this um, basis, it allows for this basis of literacy um, for a broader uh, population, so that. It's not continuously the same uh, meeting of ignorance over and over again, but there, there are tools that don't involve directly having to uh, extract labor from a, an individual over and over again that can help uh, achieve a higher level of literacy about certain policies, about certain histories, for example. Yes, Maya, what's your take on activism? What does it mean to you? So I think that I was one of the people in our early discussions um, before the panel suggesting that we start with the discussion of what activism means because it might mean various things to different people and we shouldn't assume that there's one definition. But that being said, I, in preparing myself for discussing that topic, I realized that I actually even wanted to question the privileging of activism as the primary um, political modality of, of sort of engaging in political change. And for me, that comes from my own academic work as a historian, but also my personal work um, and thinking about how I want to enact change in my everyday life. And this really comes from, I think, a deep grounding in feminism um, and understanding the interpersonal relationships as being a ground for political struggle. So even though oftentimes, like I said, activism is sort of privileged as a, as a, as a way of engaging in politics, something that I'm really interested in is organizing and what it means to be an organizer. And to me, that is important because it suggests a deep engagement and a long-term engagement in a specific community, right? So it means also talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. It means really, really interrogating and, and sort of breaking down these micro-political moments. And so an example of maybe um, how we could think of organizing as being applicable to um, what this conference is doing here today versus maybe an activist gesture, um, which I think some, is something that people are uncomfortable doing for a lot of the reasons that we've already talked about here today is um, in the previous panel, somebody brought up the issue of there only being 
the, 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 that the um, audience here is majority women. And something that I think would have been really interesting as a sort of a thought experiment would, to, would be to say, what if every person, every woman who was in attendance, or every woman identified person who was in attendance here today, um, went to a male identified person in their life, whether um, it's an intimate um, personal relationship, someone in your studio, a professor, a professional um, relationship, somebody a professional relationship with, and told them that you wanted them to come here with you today. So that's maybe not an activist gesture, but it's certainly a political gesture, right? It's certainly saying, you're saying to that other person, acknowledge the power relationship between the two of us, acknowledge this, this space that I'm going to, and that's important to me, and then also a space that I want to create, right? A more equitable, if we want to use that term, space. So I think it's important for me, and also thinking about historical communities where um, people who are oppressed are trying to make change in their everyday life under structures of immense power and oppression, right? in terms of bringing this back to the power conversation we had earlier in the day, um, to understand those, those smaller moments um, as moments of political struggle and, and self-articulation that can be brought about with something like organizing as opposed to activism. That's a, that's a great point. Um, like you said, the micro moments that you have um, don't typically fall in line with the sort of micro concept of activism um, that carries a lot of, you know, perceived or real risk. Um, Jen, what do you what do you think about activism? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Maya, that really resonates with me because when I when I think about the practice of architecture, and I think for for this panel, like I am the practitioner, I, I build stuff um, that gets built in, in cities. And for me, I think of, about it as kind of, you know, the ship of Theseus. It's, if anyone doesn't know this myth, it's a ship who leaves a shore and over the course of its journey, all of the pieces wear out and have to be repaired. And by the time it reaches its destination, it's a completely different material thing is it still the same ship? And when I think about the practice of architecture and advocacy, I think about advocacy integral to that, to that project, to that shipbuilding. Um, and it's the work of doing the change so that we're not replacing the same worn out pieces that are problematic in certain ways with the same materials, but we're really informing ourselves, doing the work to educate others as well um, to improve upon what we're doing. That's great. Um, sort of thinking about my first introduction to the Graduate School of Design, um, as was mentioned before, um, I am not in a degree program here. I'm one of the Loeb Fellows uh, for 2019. We were up here in the trays um, touring around back in May of this year and noticed immediately there were a lot of banners, a lot of signage um, that we didn't really understand the full context of what was going on. So just out of curiosity, out of a show of hands of people in the room, how many people are familiar with the SAM list or the shitty architecture men's list? Okay, so quite a few, um, but not 100% of the room. Um, maybe for people that are somewhat closer to the activities and events around that, um, um, uh, Jess, could you maybe give us your perspective on, on what that list was about or its impact in terms of how we got here today even? So I think um, a lot of you already know that the shitty um, architecture men list is modeled after the shitty men in media list that was started um, earlier on at the beginning of the Me Too movement and after the fallout of um, the, all of the um, stories that came out around Harvey Weinstein. Um, and I think that what I was specifically interested in about the um, shitty architecture men list was how many um, people involved in the academy uh, were on that list, like a, lar a large percentage of people um, had positions in, in, in the academy. And what I felt was so interesting and troubling about that was that I think the academy has a huge role in the way that we address um, systems of abuse in the industry as a whole, in the sector as a whole. Um, and I think that there has been, a, for a long time, a legacy of not teaching students how to recognize abusive systems, um, how to speak up against abusive behavior, but how to join um, an enabling force 
um, how to recognize people who can hang and people who can't, um, and really alienate uh, people who do try to speak out as as people who just can't take it. They can't. Uh, they don't have the what it takes to uh, be a competitive practitioner. And I think that the academy has had a huge role in ensuring that that's um, that that's the attitude. That that's the culture. Um, and I find that really disturbing. And I think that the opportunity is now. How can we? T teach, uh, starting at the academy, before the academy, um, resiliency in architecture, where it's not that we are enabling um, sort of abusive uh, celebrities in, uh, in the sector. And also, you know, not just speaking about the practitioners themselves, but abusive behaviors of clients towards uh, architects. How do you, which gets replicated, I think, in the, in the studio and also in the academy. Um, but how do you create and teach resiliency? How do you create and teach uh, negotiations um, and people who can diffuse situations of abuse quickly instead of allowing them to uh, percolate throughout a culture uh, and continue to replicate and replicate and replicate? Um, Jen, I'm really interested in, in your perspective as well in terms of the impact of, of the gesture of the process of publishing this list and um, what you feel the impact has been. Sure, I, I can talk about that from the perspective of the profession, I think, which is a little bit different than it is here in the academy. Um, and I think it's been a valuable tool in the sense that you know it provides this very powerful narrative for people who may feel alone in a certain way um, about their experiences. And I think it opens up the conversation in terms of all of the different um, ways and shades of gray one might see in a patriarchy, right? So from, for example, the, the feminist group that is in your firm that you, someone may think is not doing enough to more sinister um, acts. There's a whole range within there, um, which I think is a really productive conversation to have. Um, I, think that, I think that also, and maybe I think in conversations coming out of the list, maybe even this one, I'm, I'm also really interested in, in the critique of the list. So one of mine might be, you know, I'm concerned about it falling into the same um, grand narratives that we see, for example, in the film industry. First act being um, fall from grace, second act, redemption. I, I'm not really interested in centering people who are the antagonists of these stories that are, and not centering others, let's say. Great, great. Um, one of the things that's come up um, through the convergence is how the burden to press these important issues often falls on the people um, who are carrying the burden, right? Um, there's been talk about um, self-care, but I guess I'm interested in, in new or alternative ways on reorienting accountability for progressive change. Um, does, do, does anyone have um, uh, ideas about um, how to either share the load or transfer the load to the power makers, the decision makers, who are actually influencing these environments that we're either studying or working in, so that it all doesn't, you know, fall on a certain people, like like women or people of color, for that matter. Um, I mean, I can share a personal story just from the last week, kind of. Um, I mean, I'll preface that by saying that absolutely it's crucial that we um, think about how can people who occupy, um, so we all occupy some type of position within the matrix of domination, of the intersecting structures of oppression, and how can we figure out how to organize the people um, um, within who hold power in the situation. So like as a white person, how do I organize other white people to become anti-racist uh, activists and accomplices? Um, or 
um, how can somebody who's a cisgender person um, organize their all their cis friends to be uh, allies to trans uh, folks and so on and so forth um, and so just in the last week you know when the Trump administration when HHS um, Health and Human Services announced that they were going to eliminate gender identity as a category that was protected for anti-discrimination followed by the Department of Justice um, filing an amicus with the Supreme Court case on a funeral home where they also said we're going to follow the HHS approach. Um, this combined with a bunch of moves the Trump administration has made to attack uh, and denigrate uh, trans and gender nonconforming people. And that combined with the question three on the Massachusetts uh, ballot, um, which if you're not familiar with it, question three, um, basically Massachusetts passed a, um, a law a few years ago that protects uh, trans and gender nonconforming people in public accommodations. And the right from around the country has been pouring millions of dollars into a campaign to repeal those protections. So that all that all has been going on for a while, but then with the HHS leaked memo last week, um, I immediately wrote a series of letters to a bunch of people inside MIT as an institution, right, saying um, it's really, really important for the president of the university, for um, the dean of the school that I'm in, um, for a number of people in powerful positions to quickly and rapidly issue, you know, public statements about how, um, you know, regardless of what happens with either the federal law or the state uh, attempt to repeal protections, um, MIT remains committed to uh, being a trans and gender nonconforming inclusive uh, space. And that took a bunch of mobilizing and well, basically lobbying people in positions of power to make those type of statements. Ultimately, Joy Ito, the director of the Media Lab, um, actually very quickly responded. Um, and I was, I was very pleased that sort of within five minutes of emailing him, he said, absolutely, we need to do this. CC'd in his communication team. They, issued, they developed a statement and they issued it quickly. The president of the University University a little bit later, a few days later, uh, did something. And I think in that process, I'm, I'm bringing this up to, to answer the question, because in that process, it was very, very important that, um, that cis allies, cisgender people um, who aren't directly affected by these proposals um, s stepped up um, in this case to um, publicly uh, you know, demand continued defense um, of, of trans and gender nonconforming people. So, so what the action that Joy took, um, other faculty members who I wrote to, and I said, hey, I need you to write a letter to the president that the president needs to make a statement because it didn't seem like it was, it, it was not immediately forthcoming. Um, but ultimately they did, and partly because of the pressure of allies who are not going to be directly harmed. So I think we need that across all these different um, axes of oppression and resistance. So, so yeah, burden versus leadership opportunities are prompting. Yeah. Sasha, I think that's so important. It's not just that allies um, step up, but also that um, people who are directly affected feel like they have the authority to demand that labor is really important. Because I know that whether you are in the professional world or whether you're in the academy, if you have any kind of uh, like minority ad identity, there is this kind of look to you or responsibility to you to open doors for people to come behind you. But there isn't the same onus on the institutions that you are in to actively open those doors nor has there been um, this idea that you have the authority within your institution or within your, uh, your working life, your professional life, to demand that labor from people who are in greater positions of power than you. So I can definitely speak to the fact that I've come into competitive academic situations where people will pull me aside and be like, don't get involved in diversity stuff. You are about to go into a ton of debt just to be here. And then they're going to extract more labor from you that you will not be compensated for to build a pipeline that they should have built in the first place. And that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem right that you have to give up um, time that you've worked really hard to get into this institution to do. And I uh, really admire the idea of being a good ancestor that was brought up earlier. But I'm also interested in this question of what is the generation that gets to claim the benefits of the sacrifices that have been constantly made and made and made and made in order to get you into the positions that you are? Like I am acutely aware as a slave descendant black person, what are the sacrifices in you know 
tools of violence that have put me in a position to be protected, and I get to claim the the safety of um, people who came before me who did not have that safety. But what else are you allowed to to claim? Are you allowed to claim a state of being um, like mildly? removed from a, a fight? Are you allowed to sort of put things down and focus on yourself and focus on your career? And I think that what is not um, made salient is the amount of guilt that you're made to feel if you're not you know, doing that work to palpably be a, a good ancestor. But also, what is the work that you are doing to reap the benefits of the sacrifices that have already been made for you? Peggy. Um, I, um, I so appreciate both of those comments, and I think it kind of in some way says it all. Um, but um, having been at the intersectionality workshop, um, it makes me very conscious of how, um, how, how long it can take us, or maybe how long it took me, to recognize um, where I had privileges and where I didn't have privileges, um, and to um, recognize that those places where I did have privilege did come with obligations, um, and uh, and the, the obligations to speak for people who who are not not in those positions. Um, and um, I and I don't think in general we have enough self consciousness ab about that. Um, but but the other was and and I say this partly because I you know was in this school that for a very long time um, had had um, real um, sexist leadership and um, the. Um, the one thing that I also thought is that the students didn't realize how much power they had. Just to say it one way or the other, they're consumers and we're employees. And employees are always worried about their jobs, you know, whereas the students are the consumers. And so I kept thinking, why aren't the students complaining? Why aren't the students complaining more? And, and that is something that is true. But that, in some way, that also was part of the length about why I didn't then find out my privilege, which then you really had to do with, with tenure, because then I could see that my colleagues who didn't have tenure were probably not going to speak up. And so, and so there are these um, kind of identities that you need to understand to be precise about when and where you, you can do certain things. But I also felt that I learned a really, really big lesson, um, and I learned this actually from the Beverly Willis Foundation, who is another activist, you know, feminist organization, um, that you can't go it alone. Um, that you can't, you can't, for example, be the bitch. You know, it's like, oh my God, here she comes again. She's a bitch. I know what she's going to say. Oh. You know, you turn off, and that you really, really need allies. And so, a lot of this, the um, you know, the doing doing the work for for people who can't naturally um, you know bear the burden or in the, aren't in, in positions, um, is to find the allies so that you don't look crazy. <laughs> um, I I think that's important. Yeah, sort of. Taking it a step further, you talk about allies. Um, and I guess I, I always think about allies as well as targets in the context of activism, right? Because we all recognize that something's missing, that we want something to be different, um, but we've got to ha have a strategy in terms of how we get there. And so my sort of following up on, you know, your micro versus macro um, activity, I mean, how do you think, um, it's, um, I guess, most strategic to go about identifying allies um, in, an, in any particular environment. Well, I think that this is, is a critical piece is discussion of power, which, again, we talked about somewhat this morning, but I, I don't think it's possible to talk about any type of political action without a serious consideration of power. And something that I took away from the, that discussion this morning was the difference between structures of power, right? So the ways in which hierarchies are produced and maintained, but then also empowering, right? Giving people the power that they feel that they lack in order to challenge those structures. And so I think an analysis of both of those are key in terms of identifying strategies, targets, and allies, right? That at, at every instance, um, an analysis of power and an, and a, and 
a desire to empower are, are, are critical, right? And so any, and that those things need to be constantly reassessed. So I think that any sort of political vision is doomed to failure if the target is not seen as moving, is seen as being static, right? And so I think that it's really, really important to be constantly analyzing and reanalyzing and understanding how power works and also understanding where you think it's not operative because it probably is. Yes. Jen, um, what's your take on, on allies versus targets and how to effectively leverage those uh, resources? Sure, sure. Um, well, for allies, I'm really, yes, allies are important. You need them. I am, I think I'm particularly interested in allies that bring difference because then, I mean, you're all great. We're all here. I think we have a lot in common. I'm, I'm really more interested and I do want to work with you. I am more interested in working with people who, you know, maybe outside the kind of thinking that I have. I think there is an opportunity to learn from others in that way. Um, I'm really interested in looking outside of architecture for allies. I'm looking at the real estate. I'm looking at the real estate industry. I'm looking at private equity um, to really collaborate in in ways that I think that just within a discipline you you can't. Um, and then I also look at ways that architects, you know, we build one thing sometimes, and it exists in one place. And there's other industries that have maybe different ways of distributing messages. So the film industry, for example, I think especially with um, a, a, a broader Me Too movement, there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration there. I mean, that's particularly a discipline that understands the power of space in, in storytelling as well. So did I answer your question? I don't know. Why did you have something to add? Okay. Yeah, the, some of the things that you're talking about in terms of looking inside and outside and, 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 and welcoming difference, I find very compelling. Um, but I think that's something that's very um, particular and, and difficult about the architecture and related design professions is the extent to which architecture is reliant on and imbricated in again, these really these structures of, of power. And so I think that it would be total, on the one hand, I understand why looking to things like private equity and real estate would be advantageous for people who want to work within the giving system. But I can also understand why people would say that those institutions are too corrupt and implicated in structures like capitalism, for example, being the number one one that comes to mind, where you wouldn't want to work with those or see those people as allies. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, it's important to understand both strategies, right? But also to be aware of the particular difficulties of architecture and again, related design professions that makes this question of identifying allies so complicated and, and difficult. And I say this as someone who's not an architect, so if somebody wants to. No, I'm really glad you said that. Could, could I respond? Me. I think that'd be good because I think, like I, I think there is a time to stand up and speak out and I, I really respect the work that Peggy, you do, I think particularly in, in that sense, but I think there is other ways that we can be effective within our given um, areas, I, I'd say, and I guess what I'd like to also proffer and, and, and ask that we do is we all bring within our own realm, bring, bring what we can to the conversation, an expanded, expanded or diversified portfolio of activism, if you will. Please, please, Sasha. I want to jump in on this, um, this too, because I feel like, um, li like listening to both talk, I'm thinking about, on the one hand, there's how do we transform these, uh, these institutions that we're inside of? So that's, let's like, you know, what do we do with the oppressive culture of design education? What do we do with what's happening inside design firms and so on and so forth? And then there's a the question of the things that we're making in our practice and how do we make sure that that piece of it doesn't reproduce these larger structures of oppression. And to me, I want to go back again to what I started with, which is the, the sort of principle from design justice and from disability justice, actually, uh, about nothing about us without us. And so I'm thinking about how, you know, if you're, if I'm an architect or someone who's working on 
and city planning, and I'm interested in um, being uh, an accomplice to uh, movements of people who are structurally marginalized through capitalist development of cities, then what I'm going to do is start by looking at who's already organizing around that, who's organizing around um, you know, renters' rights, who's organizing around the right to the city. And so I would look to work together with groups like the Right to the City Coalition, find the local um, node that's connected to that larger network. Here in the Boston area, it's you know, City Life, Vida Urbana is doing incredible work, um, trying to think about what does the future of Boston look like um, when looking at it through a lens of racial justice, environmental justice, gender justice, and so on and so forth. So how do we rethink the city and building and planning processes you know, through those lenses and through the lens of labor and what it, what it means for the future of work? How do we um, work in coalition with groups like in LA, stop, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, who are working on ensuring that like the deployment of surveillance like mechanisms by LAPD, um, trying to minimize that, trying to um, research and target the, um, um, the fusion centers where local police are sharing data with um, DHS and with ICE that feeds the detention deportation machinery. So basically, in a nutshell, it's like what groups are already working on these issues and how, as an architect or a designer, can you work together with them to lift up and build and extend and amplify their work, not like you from the ivory tower can you know, find the solution that you will then impose upon people. I also say something to the point of, of allyship. I think that there have been a couple of statements in the room throughout the day that have been sort of focused on like, yes, well, we all these women coming together in a room, but like we really need to reach out and like, you know, outside of this context. And I think there's an aspect of that that assumes that just because you have a group of women in the room that they all agree with each other. And I don't, I don't think that's true. Just because you're all, you know, a captive audience doesn't mean that you agree with me. Um, <laughs> But so, and I think that that was kind of, uh, this has been really obvious in the Me Too movement. It was also really obvious in sort of Hillary's run for president is that, you know, just because, you know, women are involved doesn't mean all women believe the same thing. So, you know, something that I have found really striking about the Me Too movement is how, let's say, different generations of women approach uh, survival tactics in a sexual harassment or abusive situation, whereas you're going to have some women that are just like, oh, these millennials need to toughen up, or other women who are just like, an older generation has been, you know, completely complicit in, in these kinds of activities. And I think that what that says is that there needs to be more, you know, conversations between women and between femmes generally to say, um, okay, like what have been the strategies of survival? What is no longer serving anymore? And so you don't have situations where media are seeking out, uh, where's the woman who's going to, to be the one that we can pluck and put on TV and say, you know, what about the men? What about the men? Um, and I think that when that happens, that's an indication of, you know, there was no allyship around that person to be like, okay, come into this community and like, let's have a conversation about what have your survival tactics been in these situations. And then another part of that aspect of sort of singing to the choir is that you don't really need to sing to a choir. A choir can sing on its own. So you have this aspect, there, I think there's this aspect of resourcing when it comes to this kind of allyship, where it's great to get into a room together and then come to the understanding that you all agree on a certain topic, but then what is the resourcing that also comes to like lift people up into positions and continuously support them as they, as they climb? Um, so I think that is, where, um, that is where, I guess what you would call like academically homosocial spaces like really are really valuable. Um, in some way, what you're bringing up, um, and I'm going to divert this to a place maybe where you don't want it to go, but forgive me, but I, but I do want to say this, um, that um, I think part of what makes a um, strong activist organization, I just, and, and I'm just speaking about what I've seen works in, in the lobby, and I've had a lot to learn, um, is actually making sure that those differences are aired. If you're actually going for consensus all the time and like-minded thinking, you're going to lose people all the way. And so the most important thing is for um, everybody to to be heard, and that that's a, a system of difference, actually. It's and I guess I call it radical democracy. 
Um, and in some way, it also means that um, when someone who disagrees with you come and says, oh, but you disagree with so-and-so, and so, and you know, you say this, and so that must be the collapse of, of the message. It's, no, it's not the collapse of the message. It's the nuance of the message, and it's the vitality of the message that it keeps being debated and keeps being talked about. So I, I, just, I just think your point is, is very important just to the strength of activism. Actually, I mean, I think that plays directly into um, the next question in terms of the very fact that people that are fighting essentially for the same things, even if they aren't expressed exactly the same, is a direct acknowledgement that everyone's opinion, everyone's input matters. And this is not simple math. This is not, you know, it's more like calculus. I mean, it's very nuanced and everybody um, just in their um, at, uh, involvement in the movement, in the activism, um, really helps uh, to shape and form, I guess, what it is we're working toward. And so a lot of times in, in activist movements, um, we spend a lot of time, again, talking about what it is we don't like or what we feel is missing. But I'm really interested um, in each of you sort of commenting on what you feel like is the impact or the legacy of the activism that you're partaking in right now. I mean, what does the prize really look like at the end of the day? I think it's important to know what that is because then how do you gauge your progress along that continuum, whether you're getting closer or whether you're moving farther away? So we all, we all are putting a lot of time, effort, and passion into our respective activism, but what is it that we're really um, you know, aiming for? Maya? I'm going to um, speak from with the academic hat on. And I think uh, reflecting on some of the conversations that I've heard today, it seems that there's a tension in terms of thinking about an activist academic practice between um, content and methodology. And by that, I mean, is the role of an activist academic or a feminist academic to insert more of X group into the conversation and sort of in, sort of in a thinking about canonization and canon formation, or is the work of the and or, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a binary between you to choose, but I think it's important to make a distinction between the, f the former of, of content versus methodology versus the way in which you approach your subject, right? So there is a way in which I think that work can be deeply feminist and activist um, coming from the academy and still thinking about white men. Right, that, that you could be think you could be approaching your subject with methodologies that sort of um, forefront issues of labor, class, um, et cetera, that are thinking about the ways in again which structures of power and knowledge are produced. Right, so I think from my work as an academic, I would say that the quote unquote activist um, approach is moving more from the former and more towards the latter. So thinking about more about structures of knowledge and categories and how we challenge those things as opposed to re you know keeping structures of knowledge and power in place by just by adding more people of x y or z um, identity into the conversation but while the while that is important um, for me i think i, I gain more um, as as someone who's creating scholarship and also from reading the scholarship of people who do the latter jen what do you think the, the impact or the legacy, the long-lasting effect of activism is on our environment, sure. our world, our yeah. practice? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking about this recently because I was looking at the work of Jennifer Bloomer and Ann Berggren and people who come from kind of different aspects of the discipline and they they went through this exercise of asking themselves, you know, is this, is this even something worth bringing up? Is, is architecture and the feminine something we should be talking about and why? And for me, that when they were talking about this, it was this kind of exposed personal conversation that they were having that they, they published and showed everybody else. And for me, that was incredibly resonant. Um, and, and I think they pushed the conversation and made it, made it human in a real way. And I think that's something that I would like to continue to see. Um, the question of legacy, I think, is interesting because I asked some people 
who are also on the board for architects. And everybody seems to think our legacy is different. And it's really like personal to the individual. So some of us think that, you know, we're following the legacy of the Alliance for Women in Architecture, some the Gorilla Girls. I mentioned mop up work and Jennifer Bloomer. I, I'd like, I think the best thing that we can do for activism is just, you know, move forward in your own voice and, and, kind of chart, create your own, your own narrative, and we don't necessarily have to define like one way of being that in the future. Jess? Also to kind of, <laughs> also to kind of uh, like trouble the idea of legacy also is that I think it's really a attractive, and I think that um, legacy has been a huge part of creating like this aspect of mega superstars in architecture that has been um, kind of contested throughout the day. Um, what if we didn't think about, what if we weren't thinking about such a long view and we're instead thinking um, more immediately and in our own lifetime, like sort of a, a quote that I've heard before that I like is that, you know, you need to get out of this life by saving someone and the person that you can save can be you. Um, and like, how do you find ways to um, and not to t make it too existential or anything, but because time is so long and everything else is going to be swept into the sands of, of time and maybe we're not going to be here in 2040. Who, who, who knows? Um, there's this aspect of instead of plotting out the long plan, which is important, what is the responsibility to sort of plot this like short, shorter in my own time aspect? Um, which, and I'm not saying that to um, denigrate or put down any ideas of legacy, because again, they have been really enriching for me in my own life, things that have come, come before and inspired me, but I'm also kind of interested in, you know, what if we weren't always taking these grand narratives, to your point, and could, could value the, the smaller short-term narratives? Peggy, what's your perspective? I, you know, I when um, you ask this question, I think I think of it as so um, simplistically <laughs> compared to more profound observations, and I and I and I guess I just think about um, what do I um, maybe long term think are the goals of the lobby, um, and what are the short term things that make me think that progress is being made. Um, and they're just dumb things like, I mean, I just have to say every time I hear the word labor within an architectural contest, I think, yes, you know, we can now, we can put those two words together. Um, and people will actually think that that is not a way of saying um, that's the downfall of architecture, you know, that those two terms can be empowering together. I. That's progress. Um, I have to say increasing memberships of the architectural lobby, that's progress. Um, um, I um, I I think a um, it, long term, you know, I I think that what success would look like is um, people coming to the lobby and not to the AIA for help, <laughs> just to say it, because I think we actually do care <laughs> about the real issues and not making it look like it's a fun party and everything's okay when everything's not okay. Um, so those are very specific to the lobby. Um, and I think in some way maybe you also want to ask around um, progress around um, Me Too and, and feminism, but, but I actually do think a discourse about, about work, which has behind it a discourse of class um, and, and race and ageism and sexism, um, um, really does, um, is, is the essential ingredient to, to the Me Too. Um, I mean, I'm really, I, I really like what you said, Jess, because I'm, I've been reading um, Adrian Marie Brown's book, Emergent Strategy, which I highly recommend, um, which is about um, how do we do that sort of um, short-term constant re readjustment towards, based on principles and values that we hold, rather than sort of the 10-year the plan towards the revolution um, type of approach. So I recommend that book. Um, I do think that, again, back to that distinction between what happens inside the institutions and the products um, or the objects or services that we're making, that we're providing. Um, so yeah, 
long-term victory looks like, uh, you know, parity with the general population and all the positions of power inside all of the institutions that are related to architecture. So women and femmes make up 51% of all the powerful positions and so on down the line in terms of the intersections of race, class, disability, so on and so forth. Um, in terms of the things that we're building, to me, a long-term victory, future, real long-term, well, it means a world where there are no architects that are willing to build prisons anymore, so there's no more prisons, and there's no architects, you know, interest, and every every building uh, is fully accessible uh, for the wide range of, like, physical and neurodiverse, you know, and gender-diverse body types and mind types, um, and nobody's willing to build a wall on the border, and no one's willing to build um, complicated and sophisticated technical systems to surveil and control and algorithmically sort and reproduce structural inequality in smart cities of the future. Instead, architects have allied themselves deeply with social movements that are intersectional in their analysis and led by the communities most affected. And I think we can get there. Yeah. <laughs> But what a way to end on a powerful, strong note. That's exactly what we needed. Thank you all for agreeing to participate in this panel and bringing your respective and unique perspectives on, on this topic. Uh, we would like to open it up for a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we do remind you that we are live streaming and that in order for our remote viewers to get the full benefit, we need you to speak directly into the microphone. And while you're doing that, we'd like you to identify yourself before you um, pose your question. So do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, um, my name is Camille. I'm a dual student, graduate student at GSAP uh, studying urban planning and architecture. Um, thank you so much to everyone for this wonderful panel. Uh, I wanted to ask further about um, sort of, I guess, orchestrating the, the different nuances between like having, I guess, the same agenda sometimes um, and, and not uh, losing the, the core of like what, almost like the, the nuances and what we're actually trying to achieve too and how do you balance maybe um, this, you know, you so eloquently um, just put that together in terms of like what we're trying to like aim for, Sasha, um, and, I'm I'm wondering how do you how do you best navigate that and how do you organize yourselves through that or suggestions for for um, perhaps like a school that is trying to really understand like um, the power that each individual really has and how to make actual meaningful impact and change in the pedagogy in the power structures and in systemic things that are happening. Thank you. Well, I think that, that, to Peggy's point, like the diversity of, of opinions and the diversity of ideas of how you approach change is a real strength of progressive movements because so many voices are able to exist within a progressive movement that, um, that naturally um, all of those solutions and all of those opinions exist. But I think that where sometimes the things fall apart is by being conflict averse or by having this idea that any kind of conflict is uh, negative and we need to like stamp it down as soon as possible. I think that's how people feel either completely ignored or that you are trying to deny like the, the reality of their existence and therefore cannot be in allyship or cannot build with you. Um, so I think one thing that it would be really great if it was taught in architecture school is negotiations. Um, I think that would be like super powerful because not only is that going to help you kind of with client and contract negotiations, but it's also going to help you interpersonally. Whereas, you know, um, I've seen so many times in architecture firms where it's just like, um, oh, we're going to try and go for this RFP in China, and then someone wants to talk about like, oh, let's talk about like the politica the, the politics and economics and uh, history that we can manifest in a project like this, and how interesting it is that you know the way that China is positioning itself uh, currently, and that could be like an, an interesting way that we approach this RFP. And then it's like we don't have time for that. We only have three weeks to like put this together, so we're gonna we're gonna throw that in the trash. 
and that's not that, I mean, so much rich architecture would come out of just like letting that conversation happen and letting that wandering happen and letting, you know, those conflicts uh, uh, happen and instead of being like one we're time strapped into, I just, you know, feel uncomfortable with, you know, disagreements or, or debate or conflict in general. Yeah. If you're not communicating, you may not even be aware that there's a conflict, a difference of opinion, or, and understand the source of those differences. So communication um, is essential, I would agree. Um, one of the things that I try and do to create a space like that is um, I, I teach this course, which is called the, uh, the Community Design Studio, basically. And it's if you go to codesign.mit.edu, I'm going to be teaching it in the spring. Um, and the main criteria is that the um, students have to work with a community-based organization to develop a project together. Um, and so in that course, we're really it's about learning how to work together on a community-led project. Um, other questions? No other questions? We've got a hand up here in the front. Um, hello, my name is Namrata, um, and I'm a RISD undergrad. And I was wondering, um, I think one effective way of bringing about change is like giving people hope that there is a possibility of what they're striving for coming to reality. And I think with a lot of media currently, our you know future or like what we're aspiring to work for looks a lot like Blade Runner and Akira. Um, so I was wondering, like you know, this perfect or seemingly unquote unquote utopic um, you know setting that you're describing of you know this perfectly accessible space and such um how how do us as designers like convince people that this is a possibility and give people hope so that everyone strives towards it so i think that that's a very very good question um and i think that a lot of pessimism that comes from political work um well, there are many sources, <laughs> but one big one that I think that I check myself in, in terms of encountering is sort of having a vision of what I think success looks like before um, trying to, before embarking on the process of, of enacting change. And I've been really inspired, I think, by reading the work of academics who are sort of writing in the black radical tradition who are thinking very, um, very, uh, fruitfully, I think about you know the conditions of let's say like black people living under slavery. So for a long time, you know the way that that was discussed is is normally very top down, right? That being a slave is just and not to dispute this at all, but that it's just a horrible existence that there's no room for sort of self articulation or um, a sort of like a meaningful life. And there are so many um, amazing. Uh, theorists and historians are sort of challenging that, like thinking about everyday sites of struggle where, where people who, again, live under extreme sites of oppression, we could continue this into the present day, right, from, you know, slavery to mass incarceration, pick your, pick your poison, um, are still able to carve out meaningful spaces for themselves. And that means sort of re, ex, re, um, recalibrating what it means to be happy, what it means to have have a world of, of equity and, and all these things that we that we um, have articulated that we might we might want from the profession or from the world, right? And so I think that that doesn't mean that and then and that also that means rethinking how you achieve those things. So it's not necessarily all you know about going out and voting even. Right. It could not to say that that's not important, but the way in which you carve out, um, you know, a meaningful interpersonal relationship or engage your relationship with your boss or significant other might be just as important to you on, on a day-to-day -day basis as um, going to vote for a, a congressman or or whatnot. So, I, I think that that's been really inspiring to me in terms of thinking about how I see um, change and success in, in my in my own life and understanding how that operates on multiple scales. I, in in some way, in the back of that question, and this might be me projecting onto, is 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 this idea of do you believe in the revolution? Um, and and kind of, um, if you don't believe in it, if you don't believe that the utopian thing can happen, if if the revolution can't come, let's give up. I, and I know you're not implying that, but but I, um, I really believe strongly, and this is kind of a Deleuzian idea that. Um, 
it's not um, it's not the case that there's going to be ultimate success probably ever, I, I would say I don't believe in the revolution, um, but that doesn't mean that you don't strive in every single moment to make it uncomfortable <laughs> for the hegemonic culture, or let's call it capitalism, to feel uncomfortable. Every single step of the way, you try and make it as uncomfortable as possible, and that may not lead to this fabulous world, um, but it means that you've done everything to make sure that those um, forces of power um, don't run amok. Um, so I, every, every, every step happens. I also, I also think that um, it is the case that what you strive for um, shouldn't be measured by whether that thing was achieved, because generally something else was achieved, it's not that thing. So you always have to be very generous about what you think change looks like, and it's not it's very, very rarely the thing that you thought was going to be the measure of success. Um, so you have to be agile. Well, thank you again. That pretty much uh, accounts for all of our time this evening. Thank you to the panelists for doing an amazing job leading us through this conversation. Thank you to everyone that joined us here today. And especially thank you to Women of Design for creating a space and a place for this dialogue. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that galvanizing and provocative discussion. Um, I think, yeah, the, the micro to macro forms of activism, uh, no matter how precarious to self, the, the work of uh, airing and expressing differences and embracing conflict uh, and having the hard conversations, uh, that consensus can't be taken for granted. I think these are things that we should embrace and that women in design can bring on, you know, tackle in, in our group too. Um, so we are now going to take a 15 minute break before coming back in uh, for the final collaborative build. I'd like to ask that um, people um, go into the library, uh, sorry, the lobby or the library where there is an exhibition to check out by Kieran. Um, in the lobby, there is now the rolling board in place where you can um, post up the action ideas from the blue slips in your pamphlet. Would love to kind of, I think we all have like our gears churning now after listening to this conversation. So we would love to have that um, be a, a place to uh, document that and also start gathering uh, to uh, plan for collective action in the future. Um, so thank you all very much. We will see you in 15 minutes.